Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our worship service this morning with our Orville Mennonite community on a lovely day and a lovely weekend filled with lovely people on our screens uh, in our and in, in our places, wherever we are. Uh, we uh, we're worshiping during this time because we're called to worship together and we and we recognize that our holy and uh, sovereign God is not bound by our physical proximity that we can gather. Uh, that's part of the promise of the Holy Spirit that we can gather uh, even when separated. Uh, and we are personally helped by being able to see each other on our screens. Uh, but God is not uh, bound or concerned by any of those challenges. Uh, so we come to worship this morning. Um, we will begin uh, with uh, lighting our lamps. They are all lamps now. We made a last minute change about 20 minutes ago uh, to uh, get rid of the two candles that kept burning down and not being visible and add a couple of lamps. Um, so, uh, so your text will still say candle for the two candles, but it, uh, Sandy's gonna try and say lamp and you can try and say lamp too. All right, Sandy Sohar will lead us in the lighting. We light one lamp because we work for peace with our sisters and brothers in our wider Mennonite church. Today, we think of many congregations in MCUSA responding as we are to a plea to pray for peace and healing today. We light one lamp because we walk with our brothers and sisters of Aponga Mennonite Church in Dar es Salaam, Tanzania. We light one lamp because we stand with our sisters and brothers who are immigrants among us. We light one lamp because we are part of a humanity that feel threatened by a new virus and stand in solidarity with all humanity, praying for health, well-being, and peace. So this morning, we are um, we're going to uh, pray a prayer of lament uh, and prayer for wisdom and peace uh, at the request of our denominational executive, Glenn Guyton. Uh, and uh, we are trusting that many of our congregations around around the country are also praying a prayer. This is not uh, the specific prayer was not uh, was not given. So this is our prayer. Uh, others others will play will pray similar but different prayers. Uh, we'll be will before and after the lament. We will uh, we will sing a little bit. Then uh, tomorrow's devotion, which I recorded on Friday, will talk a little bit about what lament is. So if you want to do a follow up tomorrow morning, uh, we'll, it'll it'll talk a little bit of lament. Oh Lord, hear my prayer. It's in worship book number three forty eight. But uh, I modified the words to to be community oriented instead of individually oriented. And I'll just sing it, uh, I'll just sing it in uh, acapella, and then we'll sing together. I'll sing, oh Lord, and then, and then we'll, just to give the pitch, and then we'll start together. Oh Lord, oh Lord, hear our prayer. Oh Lord, hear our prayer. When we call, answer us. O Lord, hear our prayer. O Lord, hear our prayer. Come and listen, we pray again. O Lord, hear our prayer. O Lord, hear our prayer. When we call, answer us, O Lord, hear our prayer, O Lord, hear our prayer, come and listen, we pray. And a lament for, and prayer for wisdom and for peace. I would invite you to say this with me if you like, or to listen uh, and pray silently as, as you choose. Jeremiah prophesied 
They have treated the wound of my people carelessly, saying, Peace, peace, when there is no peace. O Holy One, how long will we grieve death? How many more breaths will these cycles of violence steal from sacred black lives? Hear our cries. We grieve for George Floyd. We confess that there are others we should grieve for, and yet we do not remember them. Among them could be Breonna Taylor, Tony McDade, Ahmaud Arbery, Dion Johnson, Nina Pop, Sean Reed. We grieve for each sacred person whose name we have come to know through the unspeakable grief and injustice of their death. We shudder at the inhumanity at how many precious lives have been taken. We grieve the ache of every person who bears this pain and holds fear for their lives deeply in their bodies. Lord, we lament the violence, pain, and injustice that is plaguing our country. We lament the loss of these holy lives. We lament officers and politicians encouraging peace, peace when there is no peace. We lament the absence of justice. We lament leaders and establishments pretending to seek justice, but who only seek their own power and influence. We lament the fact that we have not seen it as a loss to our collective and individual lives to live uh, in isolation or segregation. We have not seen it as a great loss to not be living with, working with, playing with, and worth it, worshiping with our sisters and brothers of different races and ethnicities. We lament that we have created homogenous communities and called them good, or even more destructively called them safe, implying that those other communities are dangerous. We confess that we are lesser because of this. Awaken us to any false declarations of peace, peace that cover over the need for justice and mask our ability to see our need for transformation. We pray for compassionate and wise leadership for our country during this time. Holy Spirit, come with fire that burns away silence and complacency. Move us beyond saying, peace, peace. Help us shape our words into stones with weight that we use in community to build the long path to justice, to peace. Lord, we ask for justice, wisdom, strength, and peace. In Jesus' name, amen. And we sing, O Lord, have mercy, again with modified words from what are in the Sing the Journey. O Lord, O Lord, have mercy. O Lord, have mercy. O Lord, have mercy. Of mercy on us. I'll change the pitch. When we're in trouble, when we're in trouble, when we're in trouble, have mercy on us. When anguish threatens us, when anguish threatens us, when anguish threatens us, have mercy on us. While we are waiting, while we are waiting, while we are waiting, have mercy on us. We are your children. We are your children. We are your children. Ah. Uh -huh.
have mercy on us. And we say in glory, let there be peace. Shines with the promise, Emmanuel. One child born in the stillness, living within us, Emmanuel. We're singing glory, glory. Let there be peace, let there be Singing glory, glory, let there be peace, let it start in me. One voice speaks for the voiceless, hope for the hopeless, Emmanuel. One love brings us together, now and forever, Emmanuel. We're singing glory, glory. Let there be peace, let there be peace. Singing glory, glory. Let there be peace, let it start in me. stands in the way his love is strong enough to lead us do not be afraid his love is strong enough to lead us nothing stands in the way his love is strong enough enough to lead us. Glory, glory, let there be peace, let there be peace. Singing glory, glory, let there be peace, let it start in me. We're singing glory, glory, let there be peace, let there be peace, singing glory, glory, let there be peace, let it start in me, let there be peace, let it start in me. Amen. I'll now invite Jen Bixler to read the passage for this morning, uh, the parable of the soils or parable of the farmer, Matthew 13 uh, in two sections. That day... Jesus went out of the house and sat down beside the lake. Such large crowds gathered around him that he climbed into a boat and sat down. The whole crowd was standing on the shore. He said many things to them in parables. A farmer went out to scatter seed. As he was scattering seed, some fell on the earth, and the birds came and ate it. Other seed fell on rocky ground, where the soil was shallow. 
They sprouted immediately because the soil wasn't deep. But when the sun came up, it scorched the plants and they dried up because they had no roots. Other seed fell among thorny plants. The thorny plants grew and choked them. Other seed fell on good soil and bore fruit. In one case, a yield of 100 to one. In another case, a yield of 60 to one. And in another case, a yield of 30 to one. Everyone who has ears should pay attention. Consider then the parable of the farmer. Whenever people hear the word about the kingdom and don't understand it, the evil one comes and carries off what was planted in their hearts. This is the seed that was sown on the path. As for the seed that was spread on rocky ground, this refers to people who hear the word and immediately receive it joyfully. Because they have no roots, they last for only a little while. When they experience distress or abuse because of the word, they immediately fall away. As for the seed that was spread among thorny plants, this refers to those who hear the word, but the worries of this life and the false appeal of wealth choke the word, and it bears no fruit. As for what was planted on good soil, this refers to those who hear and understand and bear fruit and produce. In one case, a yield of 100 to one, in another case, a yield of 60 to one, and in another case, a yield of 30 to one. So let's talk about parables, a parable, is a story, right? Uh, uh, well, and let's uh, let's mark it again. Not just a story, but a fictional story, uh, or at least not necessarily a true story. I don't know that a parable has to be a fictional story, uh, but that's generally the first thing it is. It's just a story, a story with a point. And the point of a parable is not ever front on, right? Here's the point. It's more to the side. Uh, sort of a sideways approach to a, a truth point. So instead of saying, here's the way it is, point blank, uh, it's more like, well, it's kind of like this. What a parable doesn't do is it doesn't try to teach anything particularly about the actual subjects of the story. More often, a parable would use sayings or ideas common in the culture just to make a connection. As an example, the parable of the persistent widow uh, uses a setting, a widow crying to a judge for justice. And that was something that was common in our world. A widow wouldn't go right to a judge and ask for justice. There would be levels of law to get there, right? And, and the widow wouldn't be allowed to, you know, kind of keep going and going and going. Uh, but the, uh, uh, but in, in, in the world of that day, a widow crying to a judge for justice was a common occurrence. But the, but the parable is not really about justice for widows. It is, a, it's not saying anything against that necessar uh, at all. It is, it is really though about prayer and the nature of God. So a parable is a story used to illustrate a point. Sometimes the point is difficult to accept or controversial in some way or just hard to understand without a variety of teaching approaches uh, like the kingdom of God. Uh, we've been going through Matthew's gospel and I've been highlighting that Matthew tells this story partially from the standpoint of, uh, of clashing establishments. God uh, comes to earth as Jesus where he comes, there is a governmental establishment and a religious establishment. Uh, one establishment, the governmental one, tries to kill this uh, baby Jesus, this God come to earth as Jesus person while he is, while he's still a baby. And over the course of time, as Matthew tells the story, Jesus uh, is established as one who moves and speaks and heals with God's authority and power and people are interested. They're paying attention and seeking Jesus out and following him around. And this now challenges the religious establishments. 
chapters 8 through 12 especially demonstrate the tensions between religious leaders uh, and which is really is what I mean by religious establishment uh, and the teaching and actions of Jesus so, and as as Matthew as Matthew reports in the in the course of those tensions questions and challenges by the Pharisees primarily and responses by Jesus Jesus is established not just as one with the authority of God but also as the promised Messiah uh, the one prophesied in the Old Testament and Matthew Matthew spends a, a fair amount of effort to uh, always link Jesus backwards to the teaching that they already had here in Matthew 13 Matthew records Jesus teaching using a string of parables about the kingdom of God additionally after this point in Matthew all, most uh, or many of Jesus teachings are given in parables uh, and Jesus himself explains why he uses these parables the passage in between what Jen just read uh, is part of that and, and he makes a statement later on in chapter 13 as well uh, and Jesus speaks in parables partly because it was prophesied that he would speak in, par in, in parables uh, and partly because of the challenge of the establishments so that those who want to hear and learn will be able to hear and learn uh, with some thought and trust and those who don't or who are just looking for trouble or testing or who won't understand that they won't that is the, the what Jesus is offering is not just so obvious uh, that even those who don't want it can understand it. Uh, it, it it's at least just a tiny bit cryptic, uh, just a tiny bit subversive, not quite as much as in Revelation, uh, but beginning to lean that way. And think about it, if if you live in a monarchy, especially, especially one where you might lose your head if you break the rules, uh, talking about another king, talking about loyalty to another kingdom would certainly cause some waves. And so any conversation about the kingdom needs to be a little bit careful uh, just for plain survival. Um, and so and so there's uh, there are parables uh, not only that the uh, the other establishments looking to throw darts or you know cast stones or do other things uh, so parables stories fictional stories to illustrate truth so today we look at the parable of the soils as it seems to be known in the beginning and then when Jesus explained it explains that it's the parable of the farmer the first thing to be said, and especially in our farming community, is that the parable is not intended to indicate how farmers planted seed in those days. A farmer doesn't just go around willy-nilly scattering seed everywhere and calling it farming, right? At least not a successful one. Uh, my own supposition is that that's not that image might not be just amusing in our day, but it might have been amusing in Jesus' day too. That uh, you know those those who farmed that would have heard what Jesus was saying would be like, wait a minute, that's not how farming works. We don't just scatter seed everywhere. We till up good soil, and we or how you know. However, their practice was it was it was purposeful. It wasn't just all willy nilly. But the parable is not talking about how to do farming. It has something else to say. So a farmer went to scatter seed, and it seems fairly clear, right? The seed falls in four places: a path, rocky ground, thorny plants, good soil, right? Uh, and and it seems to make sense that the seed planted on good soil grew well and and bore fruit it, it seems to make good sense that the seed planted among thorny plants uh grew well like the thorny plants would but then weeds are pretty aggressive right and they and so they and, and eventually take over and the and the the desirable plants uh are are gone or not healthy uh, rocky ground it would make sense anyone even even as terrible of a farmer as I would make uh, makes sense that if there's just a tiny bit of soil and the seeds gonna take root but any any high heat or too much rain or any amount of trouble and the plants gone because there's no good roots and it makes sense to us sure surely that a seed falling on a path isn't even gonna take root uh, so all of that makes perfect sense uh, and then he uh, and then he goes he, uh, he talks about the point of saying things in parables and then he explains this parable so the seed that falls on the path 
are those who don't understand it, don't understand the word about the kingdom. And so he says that's basically those who hear the word about the kingdom and the devil, they don't understand it. They, and maybe that means they don't like it. They just, the devil just comes and picks it away. Again, that makes sense. And then rocky ground, there's yes, and it grows fast and, uh, and pops up and, and all that. And, and then he says, trouble comes and the person essentially gives up. When we would, we would think about is that there's no discipleship or no growth, no depth, no, no taking root, right? We don't, it doesn't root down. And then the thorny plants takes root, the seed takes root nicely, but then eventually, and Jesus is specific here, which means we ought to pay attention to this one. Uh, the person is overcome with the worries of this life and the appeal of wealth. And so choked out and faith dies. And then there's the good soil where people hear and understand and, and they bear and they, they grow roots and, and, and faithfulness and they bear fruit. Not everybody bears the same fruit, uh, the same amount of fruit, but they bear fruit. And again, I think at face value, this, it seems to make sense, right? Uh, I think the explanation Jesus gives is pretty clear and uh, applying this to listening seems much better than applying it to farming for sure. Uh, you know, we can think about children. You have four children. You tell them, go and clean your rooms. One child wrinkles her nose and goes out to play. One child runs to his room, starts right away. Then when encountering the huge mess of tangled socks, whines and struggles and gives up. One child goes to a room and picks it up and organizes it, but then eventually gets distracted with a phone call and putting on her makeup or doing whatever and then just sort of disappears into the world. One child goes and cleans his room and comes back and asks if there's anything else he can do to help. Jesus calls this the parable of the farmer. So I have some questions. Who is the farmer? What is this word about the kingdom of God? And how does this fit in with Jesus' criticisms of the state of this generation of the called out people of God? And I think for our, for our situation today, we could also say, what does this parable say about our situation with racial injustice and racial tension and the response of Christians? So I don't think there's one answer to who is the farmer, but I, I think the first answer is Jesus. In the context of Matthew's story of Jesus, uh, Jesus has been speaking words about the kingdom and, uh, and people have been accepting it or not accepting it. And this seems to describe some of the people that have heard Jesus's words. Uh, so I don't think it's, I don't think, I don't think necessarily the farmer has to stay on Jesus as we apply this further out. But I, I think the first answer that we need to hold on to is Jesus. Um, he's, he's sort of liberally spreading these seeds, words of the kingdom around, at least within his community. Uh, and so, and so it's Jesus. Now, how does this how does this fit in with Jesus' criticisms of this state, the state of this generation of the faithful called out people of God? I think, uh, I think that one answer to that is that Jesus is going for something bigger here. In the scope of Jesus' ministry on earth, he focused uh, first on his own people, the Jews, the called out people of God. But the plan was, and the plan had always been, that Jesus came for the whole world. Uh, and over millennia, the people of God got it in their minds that they were special. Well, they were special. They were the called out people of God, but they got it into their minds. And again, they sort of collective, not every single person, uh, but special exclusive. No one else can be special unless they become exactly like us. That kind of special. Uh, so one thread in Matthew that you can trace, uh, and it's beginning to show as you read this chapter and a little beyond, is that Jesus is uh, slowly feeding in the idea that membership in this family of faith is not, is not about culture or blood or upbringing. 
uh, over and over he he puts he puts it in there that it is about faith and following it is about where our heart is with Jesus and it is about how we respond uh, to what God has really been trying to teach all along we'll see this some in next week's parable as well and and Matthew may be more than the rest of the Gospels, by a little at least, uh, emphasizes this faith means uh, change, action, things that we do. Uh, so we've already seen this in Jesus' earlier comments about not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, right? Uh, so with all this in mind, what is, what is the word about the kingdom of God? Starting in the context of Matthew's recounting of Jesus for the faithful established people of God, I think that this goes back to the Beatitudes. Uh, the Beatitudes are certainly words about God's kingdom. The Beatitudes are Matthew 5, 3 to 12, basically. Uh, and uh, they begin the Sermon on the Mount, uh, the, the long teaching that Jesus gave that, uh, that we call the Sermon on the Mount. And... Um, when we looked at these in February, I taught them as foundational attitudes of a life with God. Uh, the faithful are have these qualities, right, and, and, and attitudes. With Jesus' kingdom emphasis in mind, perhaps they're better understood as foundational qualities of the people of God. Of the kingdom of God, I mean, which kind of means people in the kingdom of God, right? Uh, so if we look back on the Beatitudes, Matthew 5, 3 to 12, uh, qualities of a successful follower of Jesus, a successful person in God's kingdom, humility, pure heart, hunger, and thirst for righteousness. Actions of a successful follower of Jesus or a, a member of the kingdom of God, uh, showing mercy, making peace, forgiving people, which I'd pulled in from chapter 6. Uh, and then, contrary to outward appearances, uh, the kingdom of God still includes... Uh, as successful and blessed, those who are hopeless, poor in spirit, whether because of sin of self or sin of others or illness or whatever, uh, those who are grieving, those who are harassed by others, those being attacked because of faithfulness to Jesus. And we noted that what is absent in marking this, uh, here are the qualities of the kingdom of God, uh, what are absent in those are power, position, influence, prestige, money, possessions, beauty, talent, skill, intelligence, pedigree, even faith, knowledge, gender, and age. And there are probably many other things absent, right? Uh, but those are, the, uh, those are some of the most obvious ones that are not there. And so what if these were words of the kingdom? What if, what if it, because of the context and because of, because of a larger story that's going on here, uh, what if what Jesus has in mind in this parable really points back to the Beatitudes toward not not the Beatitudes as a literary construct, but the, the teaching in, in the Beatitudes, uh, humility and pure, pure heartedness and hunger and thirst for righteousness and making showing mercy and making peace and forgiveness and and even even for hopeless and grieving and harassed and and uh, attacked people. What if these were the words, or they're not the only words, but uh, the words of the kingdom? What then might that mean for us? And back to the, the sort of fourth question that I added. If that's, if that's part of what the kingdom of God is about, then what then does this parable of the soils and the farmer, how does it apply to our uh, to our feelings and our actions and our responses to uh, uh, the racial injustice that is at the forefront uh, in our in our society in our time, uh, there are other injustices, and every once in a while one pops up to the forefront. And I don't mean to diminish any of them. Uh, and I think it is important that we uh, that we highlight one from time to time. I think it's impossible for us as humans to uh, 
to process all injustices all together all the time. Um, and in our day, we have, uh, we have, unfortunately, we have an opportunity uh, in these last two weeks to think particularly about the problems of racism and racism, particularly white and black, uh, um, but there are certainly other racisms. Um, so how does, how, and this would, be, this would be good for modification of your question for your groups uh, after this, uh, what, does, what does this parable say to Christians as we think about George Floyd and as we think about power and position in our government and as we think about, uh, as we think about how, uh, how being black has been a problem in our country for a long time? Uh, in regards to access to uh, uh, pursuit of peace and liberty and what what is it peace justice and the pursuit of happiness peace well anyway you 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 know I, I, my brain just went offline on that uh, what what does this parable what does this parable teach us uh, keeping in mind uh, that it may be aimed first at uh, what Jesus had been saying thus far sort of highlighted in the Beatitudes. So I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm not going to answer that question. Uh, we're going to pray uh, and trust that uh, the Holy Spirit will uh, give us, uh, will give us discernment and conversation with each other and prayer with each other um, so that we can continue uh to be more like Jesus. Let's pray. God, uh, we're grateful for your mercy and for your love. We're grateful uh, for our, uh, at least the vast majority of us connected here on Zoom. We are, we are grateful for our position of uh, relative uh, security uh, and peace and position in our world. Um, we recognize that not everyone has that. Uh, and, uh, and that we have uh, often had a hard time understanding how to respond to that. Um, so we pray, God, that you would uh, open our eyes and our ears and our hearts to hear uh, to hear you as you show us what this parable means as we think about our own actions and attitudes toward people who are other. Challenge us, God. Give us, give us, uh, Give us both the difficulty of your challenge and uh, the comfort of your mercy and your strength to process and to change. We trust you, God, that you are walking with us. We trust you, God, to challenge us. And we also trust God that we might not appreciate the challenge all the time. And we're grateful for your patience. Help us, move us, push us. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, let's sing uh, uh, this, it, just a basic song. Um, it's as simple as a song can get. Uh, just a, a song thanking God for, uh, for what God has done in Jesus. There is a Redeemer.
There is a Redeemer, Jesus, God's own Son, precious Lamb of God, Messiah, Holy One. Thank you. Son, and leaving your spirit till the work on earth is done. Jesus, my Redeemer, name above all names, precious Lamb of God. Messiah, O oh, for sinner slain. Thank you, O oh, my Father, for giving us your Son and leaving your Spirit till the work on earth is done. When I stand in glory, I will see his face. There I'll serve my King forever in that holy place. Thank you, O oh my Father, for giving your Son, and leaving your Spirit till the work on earth is done. Thank you, O oh, my Father, for giving us your Son, and leaving your Spirit till the work on earth is done. Let's pray the love step prayer together. Lord, open my eyes to see when you put me in front of someone, then help me to meet them with love where they are. Help us to walk together, learn from each other, share your love with others, that we may grow closer to Christ. God bless you and keep you, make his face shine upon you, be gracious to you, and give you peace. Amen.